Hey, Health Fix Junkies, it's Dr. Anna Marie from the Happy Whole You podcast. It's a podcast where I talk about all things brain health, mindset, and holistic wellness. Check out episode 454 on the Health Fix podcast, where I talk about how to transform your biology by changing how you think. You're listening to the Health Fix podcast with your host, Dr. Janine Krauss. Hey, Health Junkies, on this episode of the Health Fix Podcast, I have Anne Maria Tom back on, and we are going to be talking about probably one of the biggest sources of frustration and confusion that's possibly keeping women from losing weight in this vicious cycle that goes round and round with cortisol, blood sugar, and the scale. So Anne Maria, Tom, and I talk about our experiences in real life with our own hormones and weight, but then we also dive into what Anne Maria is doing with her clients to help them finally end the battle with blood sugar, hormones, all that jazz to help folks lose weight. So this is a fun one. Don't want to miss out on this, especially if you are sick and tired of trying to figure out what in the world is going on with your hormones and your weight. Anne Maria, Tom has you covered. Let's get on with the podcast. Hey, health junkies. I have Anne Marie on and we're going to be talking about hormones again. Um, last time we were talking about weight loss, but in particular, we had a lovely live on I don't know, was it two weeks ago now? I don't even know. Yeah. Time flies. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we were talking about just the, you know, hormone questions that we get. And of course, since you're working in the weight loss space, there's always the question that I get from people. And I'm curious if you get this one. Do you get the question of like, it has to be my hormones, doc? Mm -hmm. I swear, you know, <laughs> or like it has to be, Anne Marie. I swear it has to be my hormones. What what do you think? What do you think? Is this Oh my God. Like I don't know how many times people slide into my DMs and say this thing like, I am doing everything I possibly can and I cannot get rid of my weight. You know, so many things I'm trying and I know for sure it is my hormones that is playing a role. I'm, and I'm not denying the fact that hormones is playing a role, but one thing I want to reiterate is that hormones are maladaptive to your lifestyle and it's not the other way around. Okay, mm -hmm. so if something is going on within your body, within your hormones, you got to look at what your lifestyle is. What are you even doing with your lifestyle, you know? <laughs> and then we need to, I know people doesn't like to hear this, but this is the truth. And uh, I hope that resonates with you and you talking to your clients as well when they come with, you know, a similar situation um, in terms of hormones, particularly. Yeah, it happens. Because I mean, we all want the quick fix, right? We were just like, if it was just like, I could have a thyroid hormone pill, and I could have like my my female hormones dialed in, everything's going to be better. Because of course, there's like, I would like to honestly find the one person online that that like is out there saying like they tried hormones and their weight dropped off and they felt so much better. Because I, I don't see the magic like mm. that in my mm -hmm. office. And I'm guessing you probably don't see the magic. You see people like they've tried different things and they're still like, and I here's know. my way. Yeah. Unfortunately, there is no magic fix for it. Um, you know, the weight that, that you guys put on, and this is true for me as well. I'm, I'm just saying it as general, I'm not pinpointing anyone. What I'm saying is the weight that we put on took years to build up. Right. Mm -hmm. So what makes us believe that it is going to just going to go away in matter of like weeks or months, even if like we were giving you the most potent hormone <laughs> that is going to put everything else into place. Like today, it's still not going to happen. Weight loss should happen as a byproduct of you changing your lifestyle habits that actually got got you to that point that's how i see weight loss as um and then the more you stay away from quick fixes i believe the easier it is going to be for people to lose weight and importantly keep that off without putting too much effort into the maintenance part yeah yeah i mean it's it's uh, you know, it's just a culture, I think, that we have of the the quick fix and the quick pill. And and we forget yeah. that, yeah, it took time. You know, you didn't gain weight overnight. It didn't happen like this. Now, yeah. I saw your before and after pictures from your transformation. And I was like, wow, wow. <laughs> like when when things were really like at the the turning point for you, were you also thinking about hormones? Were you having hormone stuff happening? Like what was going on for you at that yeah. time? Yeah. 
so my estrogen and progesterone was all over the place like i i had pcos i was not ovulating regularly i was not getting my monthly cycles regularly sometimes i get more than one cycle on a monthly and with heavy periods heavy bleeding and excruciating pain after like have giving birth to two babies i can like i literally made this connection oh my god all that pain that i was experiencing in my in my 20s with menstruation was similar to my labor pain that's how painful it was wow. i don't know if anyone listening to this conversation can resonate with it you know that intense of a pain was similar to the labor pain i had with my two babies um yeah so there were so many irregularities happening with me for my hormones and my turning point was actually ditching the quick fixes because mm -hmm. i went after quick fixes for years and years and years and i felt okay this is going to be my breakthrough this is going to be my breakthrough and i always relied on external circumstances to help me get that breakthrough give me that breakthrough right like looking into myself and understanding okay what am i doing wrong here right? Mm -hmm. What is my actual goal here? Is it to just drop 10 pounds? Or is it actually I don't care about the weight, but I really want to feel good about myself. I really want to have my menstrual cycle back. I really want to have my ovulation back on track, right? What was my goal? So my goal changed in the first place, it was not about weight anymore for me. So that's when I stopped looking at the scale. I was like, let the scale be there. I'm not going to look at it. Okay, maybe like a year from now, two years from now, I'm going to go look at it and see if I'm, if I'm at my goal weight, but I'm going to shift my goal from losing weight to actually balancing out my hormones and changing my lifestyle from from scratch. And that's what that's where the big breakthrough actually happened for me. <laughs> and hence, I'm so passionate about teaching this to people, but I don't think and I'm not sitting here and blaming others, but I don't think we do. We have that patience, right? We live in this world of instant gratification. We want to see results like right away. We are not allowing us or giving ourselves permission to experience that journey as is and then just go with the flow. Yeah. I believe that's what's lacking. Yeah. And more people needs to get on board on that. And that's when you're going to see that breakthrough that you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's true. You have to get to that point where you're like, all right, I'm so done. I'm so done with all of this other stuff. Right yeah. now, I'm actually working with a coach because we are working on having me bulk up and, and do some fitness stuff. Sure. And 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 what's funny is like I'm back to the scale thing because we're looking for little changes and I'm like, oh, I left this go so long ago. I don't want to. I'm like now I'm like, I don't want to do it. I don't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Too scale funny. is a little bit scary like i don't ask my clients to weigh them weigh themselves like every day or something i know some people weigh themselves like twice a day and your weight is going to fluctuate a lot like you can go up to three to four pounds throughout the day that doesn't mean that you're gaining fat in just a few hours no you're not your hormones are fluctuating pretty regularly and frequently so that is going to reflect on your scale as weight gain and the number doesn't really matter like it doesn't mean anything unless we put some meaning to it right so i don't ask my clients to weigh more than once a week and i don't even want them to weigh one more than once a week but i know people are so anal about mm -hmm. <laughs> seeing that mm -hmm. number change on the scale um yeah i just do that just for my clients to feel better about themselves okay i'm seeing some kind of progress here but yeah i don't do that to myself personally i don't weigh myself because um, it's frustrating yeah sometimes mm -hmm. yeah yeah because you're like huh yeah it's so crazy i don't know like I, I probably set like a a weight like a magical weight number in my head in like high school and yeah. it's like stayed in my head all these years and you're like <laughs> where does this go from do you feel like you you did anything like that or any of your clients are doing stuff like that oh my god i've personally done that to myself too like i always wanted to be 45 kilograms and 45 kilograms for me is underweight damn like, <laughs> i not even 100 know. pounds i know yeah 45 that you know that came from my broken mindset that 
I created or due to all the starvations and things that I did in the past 45 kilograms, I wanted to be in the 45 kilograms because when I was in my 12th grade, I was 45 kilograms and I was looking so thin with a flat tummy and all that. But as we like age, you are going to put on weight. You need that weight to support your, your <laughs> organ system and everything. Right. But that part of me did not really understand why like having a healthy weight was important. So for me, always it was okay. If I'm not in like 45, then I'm doing something wrong, right? So it took a lot of time for me to finally come in terms with, okay, so you just have to be in your normal basal metabolic index. Wherever you fall in that, that's fine. It's not about the weight. It's all about the body fat percentage. How much body fat percentage you have and where are you carrying your fat is, is the most important thing. So once I shifted my focus from looking at the scale, looking on like a certain number to actually the body fat percentage. That's what helped me even like shift that mindset. And this is true for 99% of my clients too. They're so stuck on the number. You know, sometimes we can see so much of a difference in their body composition, right? Their body is shrinking, fat percentage is coming down, but that's not going to reflect on the weighing scale okay. quickly. If you're someone who's like strength training, building a lot of muscle too on the process of, process of losing weight, but people don't understand. They're like, even though I'm strength training, I, I, I wouldn't be like putting so much off muscle mass all of a sudden, right? <laughs> I mean, oh, there should be some difference on the scale. And yeah, that's true. There should be some difference on the scale. But one thing you need to keep in mind is that your muscle weigh more than your fat. Fat doesn't weigh that much, but fat takes a lot of space. Mm -hmm. Right? So when fat percentage comes down, you're going to look shrink, you know, you're going to shrink. <laughs> right and then you're building muscle on top of it so for that to even out and for your scale to move you just have to be consistent and just do keep doing what you're doing it <laughs> might you might not get there in six months but i'm sure if you do what you're doing you you will get there eventually in one or two years and i don't like i don't know <laughs> I, I i'm sure people don't like to hear when i say okay it's gonna be that you're gonna be there in the next couple of years <laughs> yeah yeah but, but that's what the reality is it is. It is. Do you have people that work with you for years or or is it like, do you have folks like you get them to a certain point and then they just may like, it's their job to maintain? Like, what is your program like? Yeah. So we do have uh, different hires for uh, to our program. So when we initially take on clients, what we do is, again, it, it really depends on how much weight they have to lose and, you know, how bad their metabolism is and how much work we need to put on and things like that. So ideally, we don't take any clients for less than three months. We need to work with you for minimum of three months to help you reset that metabolism first and then start the fat loss. So the metabolic reset is usually the first four to six weeks of the coaching. And again, this will depend on how long you have been dieting for, how hard is it for you to increase that food intake and things like that. So the and, and your consistency, of course, is also going to matter. So four to six weeks. So once that four to six weeks is done, that's when we go into the active fat loss phase, right? So if mm -hmm. someone wants to lose 50 pounds, then fat loss, even if they're able to lose two pounds a week, they're not going to lose all that 50 pounds in three months, they need a little bit more time than that. So if someone is coming to us for like, say, example, for three months coaching, they're going to follow the same process, they might lose like up to 20 pounds in three months, let's say. And if they want to lose more, they feel like I haven't learned everything. I really want to learn more. That's when we have the next level coaching. We call it next level ma metabolic mastery. So what happens there is that we will teach them how to get rid of that fat completely. And then it's all about building that muscle and getting that aesthetic figure that most women want these days. So that's our next level coaching. That is like a 12 month coaching. Mm. but there is no like i we do not put people directly into the next level they go through the metabolic mastery first make sure that their body is ready to take it to the next level once they are there then we um you know offer them then the next level and if they want to they move forward yes we do have clients that do next level with us for gotcha. sure yeah gotcha mm -hmm. i mean in those cases because you're working with people longer time i'm sure you see some of the hormone stuff kind of throughout the whole thing. What do you think is the most common hormone imbalance pattern that you see within your coaching practice? Yeah, the one is irregularity with your menstruation. Like we track people's menstrual cycle. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Um, and we see that sometimes it is, I mean, if it is like two or three days delayed or, you know, within that, you know, 25 to 35 days window, that's fine. But then sometimes people have less erratic cycles, right? Some of them do not um, have cycle one month, some might have like two cycles. Um, So that's something that we see. And another thing we see is that not enough people have enough progesterone. Uh, Mm. They're not ovulating. So we check people's basal body temperatures too. And again, like this can be like not very accurate because not everyone follows everything to the T, but there are some people who are like really interested and keen learning about their hormones and, you know, those things. So the other things we see is also the decrease in amount of progesterone and signs of estrogen dominance. Mm -hmm. And this is especially true for women over the age of 35 that is entering into that perimenopausal uh, transition time period. Um, And the other thing we see a lot now these days is Hashimoto's. Like Mm -hmm. so many people, I I cannot, I can't even believe like 10 years ago, there was only like 25 autoimmune diseases or something, right? And now we have 100 and we are counting. Yeah. So, and Hashimoto's is a very popular um, autoimmune condition. So we deal with a lot of people or we work with a lot of people that has Hashimoto's. Another one is lupus and lupus is very like all over the place. Like <laughs> not everyone is going to have the same symptom for lupus. Like we have a client, I still work with her. She started a year ago um, and her symptoms are all over the place, like wow. systemic inflammation. Wow. Right. One week she is able to work out. The next week she's on bed rest. It's I know it's crazy. Um, Her doctors are not even able to figure out like what is exactly going on symptoms wise for her. She's only like 36 or 37. Very young. Um, and it is so, you know, heart wrenching to see a young woman going through that and not able to enjoy enjoy the life to the fullest. But yeah, so those are some of the um, common ones and hypothyroid for sure are some of the common um, um, things that we see nowadays in terms of hormonal wise. I would agree that that's what I see too. I would, yeah. I think, I think it's across the board. I think it's across the board. And and I think these are the folks who are really obviously looking for help, right? Cause Hashimoto's yeah. is going to mess with metabolism, the estrogen roller coaster. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Do you get like questions on repeat a lot from folks in terms of certain things um, related to the hormones? What kind of things do, do folks ask you about? Yeah. So with how, how do I know if I have a hormonal imbalance, right? Mm-hmm. Like my GP is not testing my hormones mm-hmm. and when they do the blood test, everything looks fine on the paper. Mm-hmm. Um, like how, but I do have symptoms. So how do I know? So what I would say is that for perimenopause, it's not diagnosed after testing your blood. That's mm-hmm. not how it is diagnosed. It's purely on symptom basis right? Mm -hmm. So even if your GP says your estrogen and progesterone is fine, this has to be checked at certain times of the cycle. And of course, when you have erratic cycles, then it's not, there is no consistency in there in the first place. So then how are we even going to diagnose if there is no consistency in the way you're producing your hormones? Mm -hmm. Um, So that's one thing. So don't just depend on your, just look at your symptoms, right? So if you have symptoms and there are 50 different symptoms for, um, that suggests that you could be in perimenopause and you could be having a low estrogen, I'm sorry, high estrogen or low estrogen and a low progesterone. There's so many different symptoms from thinning of your hair, uh, falling eyebrow hair, the outer mm-hmm. one third of your eyebrow, eyebrow hair, if that is thinning out, then that's another sign. I'm always feeling cold, you know, when the estrogen levels are dropping, your hypothalamus is not really getting that temperature regulation signal. So it's not performing the way it should be performing. So that's another one. Hot flashes. Um, uh, what else? Breast, you know, some, some people say my breast looks odd, you know, because estrogen does really help with breast growth and also mm-hmm. mammary gland function, but mm-hmm. that, and then infertility is another one. It's very difficult for you to gr- get pregnant. Um, even if you're only like 32 or 33, it's so hard for you to get pregnant. It shouldn't be that hard, right? From 30 to 35, it shouldn't be that hard, even though your fertility is like decreasing. Once that you are 35, 36 and above, it becomes a little bit more harder. But if, if you are like 32, 33, and it's so hard for you to get pregnant, then that could be it. Um, your nails getting brittle, you know, your skin looking saggy, wrinkly, uh, not feeling good, like brain fog is big. 
like brain yeah. fog, not able to concentrate. I know, I don't know how many times women, you know, the women that I talk to say, oh my God, Anne, I don't remember what I wanted to say. I was like literally wanting to say something to you. And th- she was like literally talking to me about it. And she was like, oh, I don't remember where am I going with this, right? Like your estrogen is neuroprotective, right? Mm-hmm for memory concentration and all that you need your estrogen and when that is dropping and fluctuating that's when you feel these kind of weird things with your brain like loss of memory loss of libido and things so it's so many different symptoms like 50 different symptoms that we can actually sit here and talk about (laughs) all day every day that suggests you could be going through perimenopause and also low progesterone that is another um, thing too that women don't understand like how do I know I have low progesterone well are you getting short-tempered all mm-hmm. of a sudden right your mood is going all over the place that is a good sign that your progesterone could be dropping right mm-hmm. and do you have like aches and pains all of a sudden because your bone maintenance and all that progesterone plays a good role in that too mm-hmm. so so many different things you don't need a doctor's diagnosis to find out if you are going through hormonal changes. Your body itself is going to say, and weight gain on top of everything. <laughs> it's like cherry on top, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. Just the bonus. Now, you know, I agree with you. We don't necessarily need to have a diagnosis. And most of the time we won't get one because things things shift so much. But yeah. for the most part, you know, we kind of know. And I've almost started to be like blanket statement, like you figure if you're getting to be closer to 35 and above, you probably are going to have some, you know, somewhat some symptoms. So when you work with folks and you're like, okay, we have these symptoms, do you start to see symptoms decline as you're getting someone in a better state in terms of health and routines and lifestyle kind of things? Yeah, absolutely. I don't want to say like all of them is going to feel so much better because again, like when people come into a program, they are only going to be most of them are only going to be with us for shorter periods of time. But for these kind of lifestyle changes to implement and that to work, it is going to take longer than that, right? Mm -hmm. But one thing we can we see for sure is that everyone that comes through with our coaching program, what we do is we check their perceived stress scale. Um, so just to understand where the cortisol is at, and we compare and contrast that on a monthly basis. And surprisingly, people's stress level comes down when they are like eating the right kind of food, putting the right kind of, you know, less, less, less toxic things into their into their system. Now their body is not in like constant, you know, stress or flight or fight response anymore. Their cortisol is trying to balance out. Um, And another thing is we also do a gut questionnaire to all the clients that comes through. So gut is so, 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 so important, especially if you have like autoimmune Hashimoto's and things like that. Having a good gut microbiome and uh, really preventing that leaky gut you know, impermeable, yeah, impermeability is so important. So we do like so many things like, you know, cortisol assessment, the, the, your gut health and things like that. And we compare and contrast that on a monthly basis that paired with what we are seeing on the, in terms of weight loss on scale, inches, you know, difference in the picture. So there are so many different Mm -hmm. variables that we look at when people are coming through coaching. And of course, there is going to be improvement in, in terms of scale weight and things like that but then another part of it is also their the way they are learning to regulate their insulin levels because Mm. insulin and stress is connected right so Mm -hmm. once they learn how to do that and the cortisol doesn't need to be on board all the time it starts to balance out to more of in a diurnal pattern rather than being in a constant you know like always Mm -hmm. up kind of situation so yeah we look at so many different things and even though people only come in for shorter period of time i can see that that's like massive improvement that we see from where they started to where they are after the coaching after the coaching ends but with our long-term clients we'll be able to you know get more data in terms of what their hormones are doing because we are working with them for long term but yeah makes sense makes sense you know i think the the insulin is such a huge factor. And I think for a lot of women, that's kind of some of the crux of the blood sugar, you know, even related to whether they have PCOS or whether they have, you know, elevated um, estrogens. It seems like that if the body can kind of find a little bit of better balance, we have less um, 
issues there too. I know in our previous podcast, we had talked about the, the PGX fiber and different things you guys are doing to help yeah. people with their, their blood sugar. What's kind of some of the other things you, you do to help folks with insulin sensitivity and, and trying to really help them balance their, their blood sugar throughout the course of the day? For sure. So one thing we do is a proper assessment to find out even if, if they have like insulin sensitivity in the first place, right? Because mm -hmm. most of them do not even know that. And some of them does come in with a history. Like if you have PCOS, then there is insulin sensitivity in there, resistance in there. Um, and then if you're prebiotic, um, sorry, not prebiotic, pre-diabetic. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, if you're pre-diabetic, then yeah, the insulin peas with some kind of resistance is already there. So that's already there in the picture. And unfortunately, with the lifestyle that we are currently having, more than like 70% of women after the age of 35 is like pre-diabetic, unfortunately. So, mm -hmm. but if the, the, none of that is like evident things are not, not there, then another thing that we look at is, is their cravings right mm. most people like more than 95 percent of women that we work with has cravings okay they say i eat healthy all the time but when it's dinner time i crave for that sweet i crave for that sugar salty thing it's it's bad or lunchtime hits after just after lunchtime i ate a heavy lunch or whatever two hours into after lunchtime i'm feeling this intense craving Another thing is also that I'm waking up in the middle of night. That's, that's a big red flag that is telling mm -hmm. that, okay, your blood sugar is dropping and it shouldn't be dropping like that in the middle of the night. Then that has to do something, got something to do with insulin sensitivity, right? So my I'm waking up in the middle of night around 2 a.m., feeling hungry. Some some might not even know that they're feeling hungry, right? They just wake up and they cannot go back to sleep. This could be either your cortisol level, okay? And it also can be your your insulin, um, your sugar's dropping. Mm -hmm. So if someone comes to us saying that, like, okay, my f sugar is dropping at the in the middle of the night, then what we ask them to do is after your dinner, we usually ask people to do, do an early dinner so that, you know, we are giving enough time for our liver to do the detoxification process. It usually happens like around 10 p.m. to 11 p.m. Our, <laughs> our liver started it start its detoxification. At that point in time, we do not want to be putting so much fat and other food into our system, making it so much hard for the liver to do its work, right? Mm -hmm. So we ask people to, okay, make your dinner two hours, okay? before your bedtime you shouldn't be eating anything before that uh, before you two hours prior to your bedtime and then you go to bed but if someone comes in and say that i'm waking up in the middle of night feeling hungry and if they're going to bed at 10 p.m then we would say right before you go to bed maybe around like 9 30 maybe you can have some cheese and crackers or like a sandwich or like peanut butter toast or something that is like good carbohydrate and also like good fat and protein in it you don't have mm -hmm. to count or anything just eyeball it it has to have fat it has to have protein it has to have carb um, it shouldn't be dominant in any of these things but in balance mm -hmm. and eat it right so what we see is that when we, when they're doing it they're not waking up in the middle of the night uh, with a sugar spike okay mm -hmm. so that would fix that now if you're having like uh, cravings right after lunch and like before going to bed, you want to eat that sweet, then that has to do more with how you're eating your food during the daytime. Right. Mm -hmm. So for them, what we would say is always start your day with a savory breakfast that to a protein heavy breakfast. Okay. If you want to eat a little bit, you can still have carbs in there. I'm not saying to do low carb or no carb or anything, just just make sure that you're eating at least 30 grams or minimum 30 grams of protein in there with your breakfast. Okay. It has to be like good protein heavy, right? Um, and then, and then a good amount of calories should come from your breakfast, meaning eat a heavy breakfast. I believe in the North American culture, it's the other way around. We eat a light breakfast, then the next heaviest thing is the lunch. And then there's a heavy dinner, yeah. putting so much pressure on your liver to detoxify all this. So flipping the script, right? That simple shift is going to make a huge difference when it comes to the craving. Heavy breakfast. If you can have like a 600 calorie big breakfast in the morning, just go for it. Okay. Break your fast with savory rather than, rather than a sweet breakfast. So uh, protein pancakes with some syrup on it compared to some avocado toast and, and some eggs. I would choose the avocado toast and egg because it's savory. We don't want to break our fast by putting some sugar into our system, which is going to increase the cravings later on during the day. 
that's like the biggest tip when it comes I I talked a lot sorry I had to I had to say all this <laughs> you're fine you're fine no it's good I think for a lot of people you know we've been <laughs> we've been all conditioned right to eat the the cereals and the you know oatmeals and the yeah all those things and now we're like oh wait we, we've we've been taught all wrong, you know, or we've been, you know, brainwashed kind of in a way um, to think that there are certain types of foods that you eat for breakfast. And I love I love the avocado toast. Like since that took off, I'm like, get people yeah. behind that one a little bit better. <laughs> I'm sure you're probably noticing that, too, that it's a little easier to get people behind a different breakfast by tweaking things a little bit towards that side of things. Yeah, absolutely. And like some people I know doesn't like to eat breakfast at all. Mm -hmm. I've talked to so many women, uh, they're like, I don't want to eat a breakfast, right? And but I'm, I'm having so many cravings throughout the day. And I'm like, so how do you break your fast? That's all the breakfast is like, if you don't want to eat breakfast first thing in the morning at seven o'clock, don't but when are you breaking your fast next? Make sure the meal that you're breaking your fast with is a high protein savory meal. That's all it is. Mm hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. don't go and eat a glass of milk and some cereal like that's plain sugar that is going to dictate the rest of the day for you. Um, and if you want to implement a lifestyle where you're starting your day with a breakfast that is going to take some time, especially if you're someone who hasn't ate breakfast your entire life. I'm not saying that you should start that right now, but if you feel like that's the best strategy for you to do, start simple, right? Take small steps at a time, but that's fine. That is not going to hinder in or stand in the way of you losing weight. You just have to keep in mind that whatever food that you're using to break your fast has to be a high protein, um, you know, good balance of carbs and fat, food that is savory so that you're not craving for the rest of the day. I think you brought up something really important because a lot of people do think, well, if I've been fasting all these years and then I start adding another meal in, you know, what's that going to do to my weight? You know, what's yeah. it going to do to my hormones? And it's a tough one sometimes. Yeah. Your hormones, um, it is going to be happy because we all, our body needs fuel, right? And food is fuel. But there is a difference between eating whatever and being intentional with your eating. Mm -hmm. If you have been someone who learned or been fasting your entire life, skipped your breakfast, and you're when you're starting to introduce breakfast back into your life and you're starting that with a smoothie, I don't think that's a great idea. I would rather stick with fasting and, and eating a great meal rather than just starting your day with some smoothie or or a banana or like a chocolate or something. I don't know if someone eats chocolate for breakfast, but <laughs> I may have a few times in my <laughs> life. I mean, you know, it ha it happens. Um, but you know, to fully aware of what I'm doing, I'm um, being like, oh my god, this is bad. But let's let's you know, it, it is. It, let's go to the smoothie thing because the smoothie craze, I think, might have messed with people just as much as the cereals and and breakfast foods you know we're we're thinking like oh the smoothie well what if i add protein powder to it does that mess you know does that help hey hell junkies wanted to tell you about my pal dr anna marie frank's supplement line that specifically targets the needs of women from anxiety to depression to getting focused and balancing those hormones as well as helping with sleep she's got you covered plus she has teas too this day and age, it's hard to know what supplement companies are up to when it comes to sourcing and quality. That's why I love to get to know company owners. Dr. Anna Marie has created formulas that combine what I would do if I owned a supplement and tea company. So wanted to tell you about them. As a listener of the Health Fix podcast, you can get 10% off your order by using the code D-R-J-K-R-A-U-S-E when you head to happywholeyou.com. Now, say you're driving or out on an adventure and you're not going to remember where to find this website. That's okay. My favorite products are all on my website at drjkrausnd.com. Just click on shop and you'll find everything I stand behind and use myself right there. So let's get back to the podcast. You know, or or what are, you know, what's what's your opinion on, on protein powder smoothies? Do you think that um, helps or do you think that it's better to do the savory foods? What's your thought? Yeah, I would say like everyone's lifestyle is different. So if your lifestyle calls for you drinking smoothie first thing in the morning, and that if that's the best thing that you can do, do it. You know, you have to 
put food into your system. And if you are a busy mom or whatever that only can drink smoothie in the morning with some protein powder in it, go for it. Is it the best option? Probably not. But I would say something is better than nothing, right? Just skipping a breakfast and starting your day with just a sneakers or some kind of, you know, unhealthy thing, you know, smoothie is, is, is comparatively better. But one thing you need to keep in mind about smoothie is that is it's very convenient. That's a great thing. But the things that you're putting in the smoothie, like fruit, so even if you put spinach or like celery or whatever that is, it breaks down, right? In the process of blending, it really breaks down and it really strips the, the vitamins and minerals and the fiber out. So you're not really getting so much of benefit from the smoothie itself the way you might be thinking, right? But when you think about whole fruits, spinach and everything, there it is so rich in fiber and minerals and vitamins and all that. But this gets stripped out when and during the process of juicing. So that you're not going to be getting that much amount of fiber and vitamins and everything the way that you think that you might be getting from drinking a smoothie. Mm-hmm. If that makes sense. And protein powder is, is is a fast release protein, meaning it is going to be available to your body like right away. Okay, so unless you are someone who likes to do a heavy workout in the morning and then drink a protein smoothie, that makes sense because your body needs that protein right away to your body for for your body. Right. But if you're someone who's like not working out in the morning or whatnot, but just drinking a protein smoothie, it's not going to do too much. Yes, it is going to the protein is going to be there. But what is the protein even going to be used for? nothing. So it can get stored as fat, depending on what you're going to do for the rest of the day in terms of calories. Any type of calorie that is more than what your body needs and can process is going to going to, going to be deposited as fat um, into your adipose tissue. So I would say like if, again, like go all, all goes back to what, what your lifestyle is and what you're doing with your lifestyle. And if, if, if all you can do is smoothie, go for it. But don't expect it to give you all the benefit that a like whole food can give, right? That you won't get from a protein shake. If you can replace a protein with eggs or egg whites, then that is going to be much more, um, you know, gut friendly and everything friendly compared <laughs> to just a protein powder, which is going to be very quick release to your bloodstream not going to use it getting going to get stored as fat whereas if you consider whole food egg and stuff like that it is going to be released to your bloodstream on a much slower pace compared to the other things and the sugar spike and the sugar dip that you're going to get from a whole food is going to be much less compared to you uh, drinking like a smoothie or protein powder and things like that but again if you're working out it makes sense you can do that for sure That's a good distinction because I think a lot of people don't put that together. I mean, obviously, yes, juicing is going to strip out the the fiber. So now it's just like sugar water, Um, you know, for lack of a better term there. And and unfortunately, that's been associated with the pillar of health, which I don't know how we got there. Um, But we did. (laughs) And the smoothies, you know, I I think a lot of people don't realize that, yeah, protein powder is meant to be a quick uptake protein. Yeah. Yeah. Nowadays, like, I don't know, people put protein powder into so many different things. Like they even make desserts of a protein, protein powder and protein powders are not designed to go into your dessert. It's not, you know, there are so many other ways you can incorporate protein into your routine. Um, and if you're, again, this all comes back to the quick, right? I'm looking for Mm -hmm. a quick alternative and okay, powder Mm -hmm. is sitting there. It's very easy. I can just throw it in some water, shake it and drink it. But think is that how is your body even utilizing it, right? What are you doing in terms of workouts and other things and how it is going to be actually used up for your cells and metabolism and things like that. Um, so that's something that you need to look into deeply before considering like blindly drinking protein smoothies or like eating protein cakes and so many other things as we see nowadays on Instagram. <laughs> oh, you could pretty, yeah, uh, you could find a recipe for all kinds of desserts with protein powder in it. Yeah. But like you're mentioning, I mean, this is something I don't think a lot of people, and, and I know I haven't talked about on the podcast before, but like something a lot of people don't think about is like protein powders designed for workout situations. And so I know a lot of people, myself included, when I've gotten lazy, let's let's be real, when I've gotten lazy in my office and and I was seeing patients back to back and just trying to get people, you know, in and out and, and keep up with my patient load, I would drink protein smoothies throughout the day. And it's when my weight really started to go up. Mm. Hmm. 
And so I know that you probably have seen this with your clients. They probably described it and, and you've seen it happen over time yeah. too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it doesn't matter. Like even if you're drinking like good amount of protein or it's the best quality protein that has calories in it too. Right. Mm -hmm. And protein powder, if you look at it, depending on what kind of protein, there's so many different kinds of protein. There's lean protein, there is mass gainer protein, and the amount of calories per scoop is going to be different. So the protein that I take now, nowadays is for is, is mass gain because I'm trying to build some muscle. But when you look at the ingredient um, or the, yeah, the ingredient thing, you look at it, it says per scoop, it is, let's say 27 grams of protein, but that has like 500 calories in it. Okay, so say, for example, I'm just drinking protein because that's convenient for me <clears throat> and you're putting 500 calories like for each meal and then you are maybe probably by the end of the day, since you're not getting enough carbohydrates from the protein powder, most protein powder these days are very like lean, less carb, less sugar and things like that. So your carbohydrate requirement is not being met throughout the day. So what's going to happen is that you're going to get home feeling so hungry and starving and feeling drained. And the first thing that you're going to grab is a, is a probably a very processed carbohydrate food, a very convenient one right? So all the protein shakes you did in the morning, um, right? It's not going to do anything because you're now you're going to eat the, the most unhealthy carbohydrate or leftover food or whatever, not really thinking about it. And that can really have an impact on the way your body, your body is going to initiate the detoxification process throughout the night, the way it breaks down sugar and things like that, most of it's going to get stored as fat. So this process keeps going on and on and on, right? So it's not about like just randomly throwing things in their body it's being intentional I know like sometimes we can get so busy I do that too when I'm busy the best thing I can do is drink a protein shake I always compare so what is the best thing I can do right now in this situation the option I have is getting a Big Mac from McDonald's or do I drink my protein shake of course I'll go and drink my protein shake if those are my two options right but mm -hmm. That's how I always do. Like if, if my option is to drink a protein shake, but if I have like 10 minutes to make a meal, even though I'm lazy, I don't want to do it. But just thinking about the long term, I would like, ha, huh, I'm just going to make that meal. Or I'm going to make sure that during the weekend and preparing enough food and putting in the fridge so that when this situation happens, I have something sitting in the fridge that I can easily go and grab rather than just blindly drinking protein powder, if that makes sense. Oh. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And I think for a lot of people, you know, that's that's going to mm -hmm. resonate and and maybe be a hard pill to swallow because yeah. I, I do think that is one of the pitfalls in in the you know trying to lose weight, but also trying to keep my hormones in check, trying to balance my blood sugar that we fall into, where the the protein powder gets relied on a little bit more heavily than than I think that our body can handle, like you mm -hmm. said. And sometimes it might be going negative against us. And, and that's a, it's a really big thing. It, it goes back to meal prep, meal prep. Yeah, um, it doesn't have to be like so much extravagant meal prep that we see on Instagram these days. You know, I don't know, people are making like, I don't know, like five star restaurant type meals on on there's my feed is filled with like five star restaurant type meals. And I'm like, I don't make these kind of meals at home. I don't have the time for it. Mm -mm. Like, mm -mm. we got to set some expectations here. Like, what is our lifestyle like? Um, and there's so much difference between a real and real life, right? Mm -hmm. Like, do what's best for your life. And if that's just I don't know, for me, it's like rice and some curry and some and some veggies on the side. That's my typical lunch. But I make sure that my plate is done right, right? So that I get enough of all of it. And if I want to eat a piece of cake after, then I'm not feeling guilty, right? Mm -hmm. Because I'm fueling my body right and eating that piece of cake after that is fine. Um, so it's all about like learning how to do your plate um, yeah, and being intentional. Yeah. For sure. Yeah, I've seen those. I, I look at that. And I'm like, yeah, no, no, I am very like, I'm basic. A lot of my patients are like, yeah, I don't want to make the gourmet meals. I'm like, do you think I do that? Because it's not like that. Like, I'm seriously yeah. like super basic. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, my God. I don't know if anyone will have the time to do that. Um, I don't know. Maybe some do, but I don't like with my lifestyle working 12 plus hours a day, two kids. No, nah, not for me. No, no, I, I don't think really. I mean, I don't know. I have to always remind people that reels are, are ideas, <laughs> ideas. Yeah. 
imagine imagine these ideas and maybe once in a while it happens but yeah it's it's crazy it's crazy so if we had to like kind of put it all together some advice for folks about hormones and and hormone balance it does seem like the number one thing really does boil down to get the blood sugar balanced like yeah. number one yeah, get your blood sugar balanced, get your stress under control. That's so important. Your cortisol will go against everything you do if it's not in balance. No matter how great workout program you have, how much of whatever food you're eating or how restricting you are, cutting down carbs, eating high protein, doing all that thing. But if your cortisol level is not in check, it's not going to do anything for your scale is not going to budge. You're going to be in the exact same spot two years from now. So so get your um, sugars back in on track, get your hormone level, especially your cortisol on in check. The third thing you can do, especially if you are a female watching this, is that make sure that you're ovulating on a regular basis. And if you're not ovulating, take some steps towards finding the problem behind why you're not ovulating and do some research see a practitioner or whatever and get your ovulation back on track, right? Because menstruation and ovulation is just not for fertilization alone. There are so many different things. We have estrogen, progesterone receptors and through our entire body. And even for weight gain, weight losing, you need to have a proper ovulation. So um, again, like going back and talking about basal body temperature, check your basal body temperature. Mm -hmm. right and um, and if you're ovulating your basal body temperature would go up to one degree fahrenheit or 0.3 degrees celsius um, and if that's not happening on a monthly regular basis and if that's like a consistent thing that you're facing go see someone i would recommend you going seeing a functional medicine practitioner rather than a mainstream mainstream medicine because mainstream medicine always concentrate on acute things right if you have a problem now they have a solution to fix it to to help help save your life that's what acute medicine is for okay it's not preventative mm -hmm. right um i worked as a nurse in the er for fifth, 10 years for 10 mm -hmm. years and I'm not against acute medicine or anything. We love it. We love it because if there is an emergency, you need acute medicine. But for preventative purposes, I would say functional medicine is the best. Okay, mm -hmm. so go see a practitioner that is going to help you out with that. So three main things. Get your blood sugar under control. Get your cortisol under control. Make sure you're getting your cycles, especially you're ovulating on a monthly basis. And if you are a woman over the age of 35, this is very important. You can experience some fluctuation. There are so many things that you can go and do about it. And um, Dr. Janine's, um, I, you know, Instagram feeds mm -hmm. always talks about so many different things that you can do about it as well that I've seen was so much informational. But those three things are big hormonal wise, I believe. Is there I, anything that you like to add, Dr. Janine? I think you covered them. I think you covered them really well. I mean, that's that's my big thing. Of course, you know, fitness is the other thing. And I know you definitely recommend that as well. And, you know, being able to burn um, the calories a little bit, a little, you know, and, and with motion. But otherwise, no, I, I do really believe that the root of a lot of the hormone stuff comes from cortisol being out of whack mm -hmm. and and the blood sugars kind of following behind. And especially when it comes to weight, it's yeah. just... Tra just they trace right behind each other. Now, yep. before we sign off, you know, I think a couple of people might have some questions about testing. And within <laughs> your guys's practice, are you you're doing you said something about saliva cortisol? And, and doing cortisol. Yeah. Um, so we do test that. But the one thing to keep in mind is that it's like it has to be done privately through the labs. Mm -hmm. um, or if you want your health, um, whatever coverage to cover it, then it has to be done through your doctor. But of course, you can see a private practitioner, whoever that you're going to work with, and they will be able to order like a saliva testing or mm -hmm. whatever they feel that is, is, is important to find out what the cortisol level is um, as well to, to just analyze where you're standing. But the blood cortisol is not going to t give you a whole lot of a picture. There's a lot of um, range difference gap between the blood and from the, like the saliva or um, from, this, uh, from the testing yeah. from, uh, on those aspects. But yeah, um, yeah, we do that as well. But then uh, I, the way I like, I like to use my knowledge ab around hormones and things like that is, is ge geared directly towards weight loss. Um, so I don't really take any like people 
personally and test their hormones if they are like through my questionnaire and it's pretty extra extravagant let's say that mm -hmm. the questions i asked to find out what their cortisol is at and their high you know the stress perseverance is at so if they are like ranking high then we automatically assume that they have a very stressful life uh, lifestyle and let's give some to them some tools to bring their stress down and on a monthly we we see okay this is she was at 30 last month mm -hmm. and this month she's at 25 that's a good thing right so what well worked well for her let's do that again in the coming month and bring that down even more um, so that's how we work but yeah, yeah functional medicine practitioners are really great if you want to get some testing done to find yeah. out what your cortisol is <laughs> makes sense makes sense no i like the surveys because i mean we yes we can pretty much tell <laughs> if someone's yeah. cortisol is high versus low versus you know up and down or all around um yeah. It makes perfect sense. And so, yeah, I was thinking a couple of folks might wonder that. Might, I'm curious on your opinion with folks that come in with like the levels, continuous glucose monitors, or if people, you know, if that's, if you found that to be helpful at all in your particular way you're working with folks with weight loss. Yeah. So it's certainly great to have data, right? Like accurate data. But at the end of the day, what are we going to do about it? It's, it's going to boil down to what are we going to do about it, right? Mm -hmm. So if you're symptomatically, t you know, showing that you might have insulin resistance, or you're coming in with a blood result saying that you have actual insulin resistance, same with cortisol as well, right? If you are like ranking very high on the cortisol scale, or you're coming in with a test that says your cortisol level is chronically elevated, it boils down to what your intervention is right? Mm -hmm. What are you even going to do about it? So what I do is, again, like I really depend on my assessment um, with my clients, and I don't d really do blood tests and things like that. But I whatever, like, I assume if 35 years and up, if they have the two or three symptoms, as you know, as I stated above, and they're experiencing weight gain, they have all these things and cravings and all that, then they do have some kind of thing happening with their insulin production or release or the uptake by the cells, or, you know, the way their cortisol is being released. Mm -hmm. So I automatically implement the midlife makeover protocol is what I call the protocol mm -hmm. that we use on on, on women like this, I automatically implement that protocol into the nutrition and exercise part of things. And then we reassess on a monthly. Makes sense. Makes sense. I mean, I think there is a lot we can do and just using our intuition and our our results if we're surveying folks often. I mean, I think that's good as good as testing with the yeah. questionnaires because yeah. you're going to find out one way or other there. Yeah. Yeah. Cool cool stuff you guys are doing great stuff i really like what's what's happening and Thank i you. i like that you're also taking into account the hormones and and definitely i do agree like blood sugar blood sugar blood sugar yeah if you guys didn't, if you guys didn't get that by now blood sugar just blood saying sugar. Yep. Mm -hmm. <laughs> important so tell folks where they can find you of course and where they can hook up with you guys you and your husband because i know he's not on today but tell us a little bit about where folks can find you how they can get in touch with you to get into your programs absolutely first of all janine thank you so much i'm really honored to be back on your show yet again mm -hmm. um and to all the folks that are listening to us today we talked a lot about glucose control stress and all that and stress was something that stood out you know, it was speaking out and loud. And most of us do go through these episodes of stress. Um, since we are like 30 years and up, we have kids, we have so many other things happening. Mm -hmm. And it's really important for you to see weight gain and also in terms of weight loss and in not also in terms of symptom management. So it's very important. So since you guys listened up till the end of the podcast, I do want to give out the stress toolkit that we give to our clients absolutely for free to you. All you need to do is go find out me on Instagram. My handle is and Maria Tom and send me the keyword Janine then I'm going to be sending you that stress toolkit that I talked about okay so DM me on Instagram and Maria Tom send me the keyword Janine then I'll send you that stress tool kit for you to work on awesome thank you so much Amory I appreciate it look forward to chatting more as we move forward and just Absolutely. helping folks out uh, one one day at a time one day at a time here <laughs> thank you so much Janine have a great day too. 
Hey, Health Junkies. Thank you so much for listening to another episode of the Health Fix podcast. To help support my mission to bring you tips, tricks, and tools to help you optimize your health, I'd be grateful if you'd like, subscribe, and write me a review for the podcast. And if you hear a product you're interested in on the podcast, you can now go over to my website to learn more. That's doctor spelled out, J-K-R-A-U-S-E, nd.com. Just click on shop and you'll find all the information on my favorite products that I stand behind and use myself. All affiliate income earned with your purchases goes directly to help support the production of the podcast so I can keep bringing you quality health information. I appreciate your support and I'm honored to have you listening to my podcast as a fellow health junkie. Thanks again.